Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, the case I'm presenting to you this morning is a 60-year-old male with uh, actually originally had malignant hypertension refractory to multiple medications. Um, no other significant mass past medical history. As you can see here, he was on at least five medications for the hypertension and required uh, additional workup. Next slide, please. I uh, got imaging done to evaluate his renal arteries. Um, of course, looking for you know, renal artery stenosis, but interestingly, was found to have bilateral renal artery aneurysms. Um, next slide, please. Which are better appreciated on this coronal uh, reformat. Next slide, please. A uh, couple weeks ago, we brought him uh, for uh, uh, angiogram for uh, planning procedure. Um, and this is our uh, diagnostic angiogram from the left renal artery uh, via, of course, radial access. And you can see that there's robust filling of that aneurysm uh, off the upper pole branch right there. Next slide, please. Um, we did rotational angiography uh, for the purposes of um, 3D mapping and to uh, prepare for the procedure today. So the way that I'm in interpreting this anatomy is that there is a single branch vessel that's feeding into this aneurysm. It's a fusiform aneurysm. I, I don't... I don't think that there's a perceptible neck right. uh, and there is a single outflow uh, okay. and it's uh, uh, you know uh, supplying the anterior uh, upper third of the kidney you, you can see that the the renal artery sort of bifurcates into a anterior and a posterior moiety which is you know very common with renal anatomy and this is specifically off the upper pole anterior moiety. So that's how I'm in interpreting this. I, 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 I hope that as you're looking at the 3D, it's, it sort of helps you conceptualize right. it. Right. So basically, it's a, it's a vessel that is diving inside the aneurysm, if you will. Correct. Okay. The other kidney has an aneurysm as well. I don't, I don't think that was shared uh, in the presentation, but there's a 12 millimeter true bifurcation aneurysm. It really almost looks like a, like a basilar tip aneurysm. That we're obviously not going to treat uh, for size concerns, and I think it's going to be a much more of a complex reconstruction. I, I think I think this the uh, the collateral damage will be will be minimal, if any. So I'm just going to go through our setup very quickly. You can see we have a, a detachable coil ready to go here, but essentially we have a six French uh, slender sheath in the in the left radial artery. Uh, we have a, a six French uh, Sherpa. Uh, guide catheter in the left renal, which really seated very, very nicely. I'll, I'll, I'll pan out for just a second so you can see this. So we're, we're really well positioned in the left renal. Through that, we have a 150cm uh, direction microcatheter, and now we're inter about to introduce a uh, interlock coil. And so we're you know, sort of playing with the coil a little bit just to see if we can get it to, to sit. And I, I'm starting to like this. And if we could get this to sit, I think we might put in one more and then move back into the aneurysm. So this is just the simple pusher wire. The radiopaque marker is actually coming out of the microcatheter here. And it's not until that actually separates, you actually saw it separate on the screen, that I can retract it and then the coil stays in place, okay? And so that is the, the mechanical detachment that the interlock allows specifically. We'll, we'll show you a couple of more coils uh, over the course of this, this, this case, just to give you an idea of the different detachment mechanisms. But for this specific coil, it's a very simple sort of snap detachment that you can reposition it, as you could see before when I was positioning in this coil. And it's not until the, the, the radiopaque snap exits the microcatheter that it's truly separated. I thought about using a plug, and what, what this gets into, and uh, you know, we, can, we can comment about this a lot, is that uh, sometimes the different technologies are not compatible with the same microcatheter. And so this goes into the issue of whether you're using an uh, 024 microcatheter or an 028 microcatheter. Um, I think the ideal plug for this would limit our ability to use a very broad spectrum of coils. We'd probably be only limited to one or two different types of coils. We wanted to try and show you a, a whole variety of different coils for this case. We have a, this is obviously back in the outflow for the aneurysm. So I, I think what I'm going to do now is shift to larger coils.
to fill up the aneurysm. This is a very long coil, and, and again, this is a interlock. It just gives you an idea about how with, with one coil you can fill up so much space within a complex aneurysm like this. And again, still it's not out of the microcatheter, so I can reposition it and uh, wait until the last second to detach it. The, the accuracy of something like this isn't as critical, obviously, but I think it's just a nice demonstration of with very, very long technology how you still have full control over it. We are going to uh, switch over to a different technology just to close up the inflow to this, and then you guys can come back. We'll, we'll show you how the other coil technology works, and we'll show you our final run, okay? Fantastic. So we've, we've switched over the technology now. Now we're using the um, Azure CX HydroCoil, um, and you can see we're packing the inflow. And it's going to be out in just a second, and then we'll show you the detachment mechanism. So the, the, the handle uh, takes the back end of the pusher wire, and you get feedback uh, of this light that shows that it's engaging with the back end of the wire. And then by pressing the button, it tells you when it detaches. Or does it? There we go. There you go. Okay. So now you'll see under fluoroscopy, when Ed retracts the wire, nothing else is, is coming back. This coil, because it's coated with a hydrogel, once it's exposed to, uh, to blood, it expands. Um, and it tends to fill up space uh, in very unique ways, uh, you know, probably a little bit differently than the, than the fiber coils that we were showing you before, because uh, it'll find the path of least resistance and it'll fill up crevices. Uh, in a, a little bit of a, a, a better way than perhaps fibers. I think you can see that the, the marker of the microcatheter is right at the inflow now, and we're, we're sort of just getting into that, the, the last little piece of the neck there, and we're filling up the inflow. And so we don't want to be you know, too aggressive with trying to force it through. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that it, it sort of contours to the shape of the aneurysm and to the inflow vessel very, very well. Uh, and we're using that, those uh, attributes of this coil you know, with this kind of anatomy. You, obviously, if you use something that's too stiff, you don't want to injure the, uh, the uh, patient. Uh, so it, you know, thank you for recognizing that because that, that is one of our concerns here. We want to use something that's very atraumatic. One of the things that I think comes into play, I know this patient can't be super tall, but if the patient was taller, we would be limited in our shapes. This, this particular guide catheter is nice. It has a, has a cool shape, and it works well in this type of anatomy. But if we had a taller patient, we may need 110 or even, one, even yeah, longer. Yeah, I, 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 I really like Sherpa for you know, distal renal interventions and for distal uh, SMA interventions. It looks like you're hubbed at the sheath there. I, I, I don't know if the camera can pan over to the sheath just to show. Yeah, the, 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 this actual guide cath, which is again a, a, a 100 guide cath, is, is, is totally hubbed. Uh, we, have, we have a long micro catheter, so you know, the working length is just very nice right now. And as you can see, the coils really did contour to the aneurysm beautifully. Um, and, you know, I, I was sort of joking with, with Ari before about what our endpoint is, but this is pretty darn close to not being able to see through the actual platinum mass. Mm -hmm. Looks great. So, unless I'm mistaken, can I see that unsubtracted, please? The outflow is still filling. Even though, you know, even though we think that the kidney is an end artery, Rob, we know that there are collaterals that sort of can perfuse that, although I don't know that it, it, that's what's happening in this case. It, it looks to me like it's probably so, going so what's, 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 around what's, it. What's interesting is that the outflow is filling, but if you look through the coil mass, there's no contrast growing through the coil mass. So you think it's sort of on the undersurface of the artery right where as it makes that turn? I don't know. It's possible. Uh, I, th I think we're going to take a couple of different views, yeah. but it certainly looks pretty good right now. Uh, but I, I just want to be obviously a thousand percent sure that everything's okay. It looks great otherwise. All right. Yep. Okay. So thank you guys very much, and uh, you know we'll uh, we'll we'll see you in in the, in the next room. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. Okay.